So I'm going to introduce Kerry and uh, welcome Kerry. Uh, Kerry is a writer and academic. Uh, she's working on women's literature and the history of walking. Uh, she's also herself a keen hill walker and there's an expression we have in the UK called uh, uh, a Munro bagger. She might explain what that is. Uh, she is a Munro bagger. Um, many of you will know that she's just uh, had a book published called Wanderers, A History of Women Walking. Um, the extraordinary news is it only published this month. It's already out of stock and in reprint. And um, Terry uh, tells us the reprint will be in stock again before the end of the week. So we have a, uh, an author with a bestseller. And um, it, the book itself combines her passions of uh, walking and um, she's currently working on a follow-up book about trailblazing women. And as we probably have learnt, she lives in the Scottish border. So, Kerry, welcome and um, lead on. Thanks ever so much, Andrew. Um, I've been given very clear instructions from Andrew to not talk for very long um, before we open it up to conversation. So, what I'm going to do is just show a few slides and talk around those for a, a fairly short period of time, which will mean lots and lots of gaps in what I say, which will hopefully give you lots and lots of room to ask questions and to explore things that you're interested in in relation perhaps to what I said, but also to see where the conversation takes us. I'm really interested to hear what you're interested in, what, what sorts of questions that you come up with. So I will not be speaking for a huge amount of time um, and then I'll be turning the floor over to everybody in the room. So I hope that's all right. Um, I'm now going to attempt to share my screen, which worked very well yesterday, but we'll see if it um, works today. Right. That looks like it's working. Excellent. Um, so I'm just going to, as I say, talk very briefly just about a few things that um, for me are of particular interest. And this may or may not be the, the sorts of things that um, piqued, your, piqued your attention. But as I say, use these as a launching off point for further discussion. So what I was um, wanting to start off with was just opening up this idea of what the history of women's walking might be. Um, it's obviously the, the subject of my book, but I think one of the things that I found when I was writing the book was that there were lots and lots of possible histories that, it, that could be written, and indeed that I hope will be written. I very much hope that my book is just the first or one of the early words in the story rather than the end of the story. So I am very much hope there will be other books potentially offering other histories. But what I wanted to explore with that idea was to establish, first of all, that women were walking when walking transitioned from being uh, a, a pragmatic activity. That you had no other choice, either because you were poor or because there were no roads, you know, that walking was just something that most people did. And there's a transition in the 18th century from those sorts of ideas of walking as a practical purpose and then walking becoming something slightly different. Um, in the 18th century, it gets connected with things like uh, radical politics, with social unrest, um, but also with an increasing interest in walking as a creative practice, walking as some, some sort of spiritual activity, perhaps, uh, walking as a way of accessing some sort of inner landscape in the human by accessing the outer landscape of the wider world. So my sense of a, a history, and it is a history of women's walking really that I've written, is that it's establishing that women were there as that transition took place. Because I think we're all very familiar with stories of people like William Wordsworth and other writers um, who were off walking the hills of the Lake District or wherever as that transition was taking place. But we don't often hear about the women and they absolutely were there. And the archives are full of all sorts of interesting tales um, that I didn't have room for uh, necessarily in my book. And as I say, I hope very much that other people will take up um, some alternative stories and perhaps flesh them out in a, in a way that I didn't manage to in this book. So as I sort of touched on, walking has associations with, with status and, at, and as, at various points throughout its history, um, it's, it's sort of fluctuated those ideas of, of status. So um, we're probably all familiar with um, the kinder trespass uh, and that being a working class um, a piece of activism, particularly. Um, so there are, are class ideas associated with walking all the way through its history. Um, and at some points it's seen as um, something that vagabonds do. 
And the woman that I started the book with, Elizabeth Carter, was very aware of that association. That if you were wandering, you were a vagrant rather than someone who had a home, who had a base, who had roots and was a contributing member of society. So one of the things I'd perhaps be interested in exploring with, with people in the room today is thinking about walking status now um, and whether it has those connections with vagabondism or vagrancy or other associations that are perhaps more high status um, that, that mean that it has more cultural value. Um, so those perhaps are ideas that we might want to explore. But also at the root of what I was trying to do with the book was to think about walking as a creative activity, because as I say, the people who were there as, the, as it transitions from this slightly socially dubious activity into something different, a lot of male writers, at least in the histories that we've inherited, so it was important to me when writing the book to establish that women were using walking for creative purposes as well, that women writers were using walking for those culturally approved, you know, more high status purposes, the same as men were. Though as I was exploring their stories, it became very clear quite quickly that women's experiences of walking, whilst also creatively powerful and personally powerful, were quite frequently different to the sorts of experiences that men were having. So that was for me something that was really interesting. And again, that might be something we want to explore in more detail. So one of the things that sort of jumped out at me from Dorothy Wordsworth's account, for instance, was when she had very particularly female experiences, some of them unpleasant, uh, when she thought that her sister-in-law had attracted the attention of a man who was going to attack them uh, and then has some sort of meltdown when she reaches safety and the accommodation There's a knock on the door on a murky night, very much like this. Um, thinking that it was this man who'd come down to, to to attack them, which I don't think is an experience that men would have had, or certainly not not that I've read about. Um, so there are these particular female experiences, that not all of them like that. There's, Dorothy also has this very profound and moving encounter with a family of women who are grieving the death of their child, and they're invited into the domestic space, Dorothy and her sister-in-law, um, in a way that I don't know that men would have been, and become participants in the family's grief. So walking has opens up different possibilities for women, but it seemed to me important, given how walking is written about, to establish that women were using it for the same sorts of culturally powerful way, in the same sorts of culturally powerful ways that men were. So again, as I say, those are some of the ideas, some ideas we might want to tease apart a little bit. Um, and because of that methodology that I chose, that women had to have been writers, they also, for the purposes of the book, had to have reflected on their their walking and how it related to their writing. So that meant that quite a few people that did, did walk, and there were hundreds and hundreds of women who wrote about walking, um, it meant that I didn't include them. Uh, so one of the writers I'd have loved to include was Jane Austen, um, in part because I adore Elizabeth Bennet and how she trudges off through the fields and covers huge distances and ends up with filthy hems. And she's just one of the most amazing walking figures in literature, and I absolutely adore her. But Jane Austen, who was herself a very keen walker, just in her letters literally just wrote, I went for a walk and I didn't feel like I could construct much of a story that would have been of interest out of that material. So reading these letters, <laughs> I'm just so frustrated that I couldn't put Lizzie Bennet's creator into a book about walking, despite Lizzie Bennet being so fantastic. And there were other sort of difficulties and, and other books will be able to tell those stories. I chose a quite a restrictive methodology for my book. Um, but there's lots and lots of other stories. Uh, one that I really, really did come close to putting in was Mary Wollstonecraft, who went up to Scandinavia um, in the 1790s on a very secretive mission on behalf of her former lover. And she's while she's there, she keeps a journal. And in that journal, she's recording her thoughts about the failure of her relationship. She's given birth to a daughter out of wedlock. So she's mulling on being a mother and being a woman in the 1790s when there are very few opportunities. And she's also thinking about what that means for her daughter. And while she's there, she's traveling through Sweden and Denmark and Norway. And at various points, she pitches up on very beautiful and sublime coastal areas. And she goes off on walks and that's in those spaces that she starts to think quite deeply about her status in the world and her daughter's future status. Um, but not in any particularly sustained way. And again, there wasn't quite enough there for me to tease out a, a chapter's story. But there are so many characters out there um, that I hope that there will be lots and lots of other books written about women and their walking. So um, I've talked to you a little bit about the methodology. Um, 
what gave sort of birth to the book to start with uh, was was me getting quite ticked off at men writers who just seemed to draw on the same male writers of the past and and using those as their examples. Um, I, I was reading Robert McFarlane's The Old Ways, um, that was perhaps one of the prompts, and the way in which he drew on Edward Thomas, and I, I, I just didn't know if that was something that's, that meant that women just didn't walk or they just didn't write about their walking, but it didn't seem to ring particularly true to me, so I started heading off into the archives and just rooting about and seeing what I could find, because it didn't seem to me to ring particularly true, especially when I was reading other books by men about walking, when they were so dismissive that women couldn't walk, they wouldn't have wanted to walk, they wouldn't have enjoyed it, they didn't have the opportunity to. Um, it didn't make sense to me that that would have been the case for 300 years. So those are sorts of, the, it was basically me getting really cross um, and being a, an 18th century and romantic era scholar, um, archives are what I know and what I do. So that's that's where the, the book started and then it sort of grew uh, disturbingly close to the present, which is a, you know, I'm used to dealing with dead writers. Um, so it was a bit unusual to be writing into the 20th century, but that was really exciting for me uh, once I got over the fear is, is, is and, and tracing that um, that trajectory and thinking as well. And I think one of the things that emerged as I was writing the book was thinking about what it might mean to be a, a woman walker and what it might mean to be a woman walker with a tradition of women's walking behind me. You know, having always you know been on the hills with with male examples, you know, the stories of men, you know, William Wordsworth was the person I, I knew, but I didn't know about Dorothy's walking. Um, so partly what shaped the book was my own experience as a, as a woman walker, having had some interesting experiences with male walking companions, for instance, uh, not always as supportive as one might have wished. And again, sort of in parallel to what Dorothy Wordsworth found, which was having those different experiences as a woman walker, which I'd never really thought through or given very much thought to. But once I started writing this book, I did start to realise that when I walked on my own as a woman, I spoke to more women than when I walked with my husband or when I walked with male friends. And those conversations were really quite interesting. And I got invited to someone's house. You know, we met randomly on a hill and she happened to live at the bottom of it and she invited me to her house. And I don't think she'd have done that if I'd have been in the company of men. So it was interesting to me, partly, that my present day experience is mirrored in some ways the experiences of women walking 200 years ago, but also as their stories grew inside me, starting to think about how that shaped how I thought about my own status as a, as a woman walker. So those are sorts of perhaps some of the things I'd be really interested in exploring tonight, though I'd be very happy to see where the conversation takes us. Um, but that is a, a question we can perhaps explore, is what might a female tradition of walking look like? And for those of us who are, who are women in the hills, what might that feel like to have that as a backs. So I've got a few provocations that um, I'm going to fling out into the group and see what happens. Uh, we may or may not talk about these, you may have your own uh, questions. Um, but one of the things that I'm very interested in doing is exploring why does mountain literature continue to marginalise women's stories? Why, why does it tend to not include them? Why, and why do they find it difficult to tell their stories? And my own experience of getting this book published was, was really tricky. You know, I struggled to find a publisher, I struggled to find an agent to take it. So we might want to think about the stories that, that get told and also the mechanisms behind the publishing industry and what role they have in the sorts of stories that get, get told. Um, and the, as you can see, these are questions that are rooted in my own frustrations whilst writing the book, is why accounts of walking so reluctant to allow that women have walked, do walk, enjoy walking, find walking enormously powerful. So why this reluctance to acknowledge that? Um, so some questions um, for you. What effect have the stories told in mountain literature had on your experience of a walking, uh, whether you're, you know, you're a woman or a man? Um, what Have they shaped how you see yourself in the mountains? or in the hills or along the rivers, wherever it is that you do your walking. And I also wanted a, a much broader question. What might we do differently as walkers, as part of a community of walkers, thinking about the sorts of stories we want to tell about what we love? So those are some provocations. I'll now hand over and stop sharing my screen and hopefully open up the floor to everybody else. Uh, Milena, you're, you're writing about early 20th century women writers. Would you like to say anything about 
what you're doing and how that relates to what Kerry's talked about? Well, first of all, I just wanted to say um, thank you, Kerry. And I, I recently read your book and I absolutely loved it. Um, I guess um, I'm really interested in this idea, particularly when you talk about of, like, rural walking um, and this idea of kind of mountain stories and things, because I think with my own research, uh, I definitely look a lot at the sort of differences between kind of urban walking and rural walking um, and the different sort of um, create, creative potentialities of each of those. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, I would just be interested to sort of hear what other people's experiences are, especially if I know a lot of you are involved in women in the hills and things like that. Um, and I mean, I personally haven't really got much experience of walking in that kind of wild environment. So, um, yeah, that's more more questions really rather than answers. But um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks ever so much, Mayor. It's really interesting, and I, I think I, I would be really interested to hear what other people have to say about the relationship between the rural and the urban, because I, I think I unconsciously perpetuate that that split that we we use. Is that, you know, the rural is somehow more spiritually pure; it has more access to nature, and that is somehow better for us as people. Whereas mm. urban walking is somehow, you know, what we do because we've got no other option. Um, Whereas some of the writers I've looked at, for, for them, urban walking was the way of accessing creativity, that that, that was the most powerful thing. And I'm thinking of Virginia Woolf in particular, someone who did both kinds of walking, who found both mm. essential to her status as a writer, to her creativity as a writer, but also to the stability of her sense of mental well-being, that, <laughs> excuse me, too much of one or too much of the other would lead her to spiral, that, that she had to have them both and hold them in balance. So. I think I think that's I, I'm not going to talk very much more. I'm, I just I think that's a really interesting uh, topic to consider. So it'd be lovely to hear what other people have to say. Yeah, I think that would be something. I mean, I, I don't know. I'd love to hear more what other people think about it as well. But yeah, just that idea of whether it's possible to kind of um, yeah, whether those two forms of walking are actually part of a kind of connected whole then, and whether there is actually yeah something to be said about kind of not viewing them as as two sort of distinct forms of walking in a way. Um, I just think that's very interesting as well. Um, okay, thank you. Um, uh, Beth Hodgett has uh, said she has a question, but we know not what it's about. So Beth, do pitch in. What, what's your question? I guess I was kind of um, struck by the way that you're talking about um, you know, the very righteous kind of anger and indignation when you're reading um, these kind of male canons of uh, walkers. But I guess my kind of question uh, for you is reflecting back on when you're kind of asking the question, what does a female tradition of walking look like? Um, and I have kind of need to preface this by saying I'm afraid I haven't managed to get a hold of a copy of your book yet. But do you think that the way of creating a kind of alternative female history of walking is just to replicate a male canon, but with female writers? Because I'm thinking, for example, of Robert McFarlane's introduction to Nan Shepherd's book where he kind of tries to slot her into a canon of like phenomenological writers. And I think in doing so, he completely misrepresents what Nan Shepherd is actually doing. So I guess I'm kind of, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on whether or not we actually need to recreate canons at all, or whether there might be a better feminist way of writing about women in nature that doesn't really refer to canons of walkers at all. I, th I think you're absolutely right that there are, there will be many better ways of writing about this tradition. and. The one that I've pitched on, as I say, there were very specific reasons for that. And I think you're, the way in which you relate that to what Robert McFarlane does with the introduction to The Living Mountain is really interesting because I had the same sort of reaction. And I also had a sense of frustration that here we had again a male writer co-opting a female writer and presenting her to the world. Um, and I've, I've just, uh, I was on... Twitter yesterday and I saw James Rebanks, who I adore and I think is a fantastic writer and a really interesting voice and a very nice person, but talking about um, Rachel Carson in the same sorts of terms that he was, he'd mentioned to her now all of a sudden her books were selling really well and, and I just had that similar sort of pang that why does it take a man to get a woman's books out there? So I think you're right. I don't think I have the answer to the question, though. I don't think I know how to do it, and I didn't know how to do it with this book. 
um, whether subsequently having felt like I'd established a baseline of, you know, yes, women are here, yes, women are important, creativity, yes, walking is important to women, that I hope that that would mean that there's now a basis for people to do the much more interesting work that you're talking about of creating alternative traditions that look potentially nothing like the canons of men conquering, of suffering, of dying, of, you know, whatever it is that they get up to on these mountains. <laughs> um, and, and, and perhaps, and, and this perhaps brings in the earlier conversation we were just having about the role of the urban, the local, the familiar, the walking that gets squeezed in between childcare and domestic work. Um, those sorts of unglamorous, but so essential types of walking, you know, the incidental, the, 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 the trivial, you know, I think there's enormous power in those too, um, and finding a place for those sorts of voices. You know, so it doesn't have to be this grand expedition to be worthy of note. Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there are lots and lots of ways we could write better about this. Um, I don't know if that's at all a helpful answer because I'm basically surrendering and say, yeah, mea culpa. But your your question really excites me, and I hope that that's exactly what happens. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, Mary Claire. Mary Claire, you've written quite a lot in the chat. Do you want to talk about your your question? Um, a comment? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can. can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I I actually suddenly got into a conversation with somebody called Sonia. Um, <laughs> um, there was there's a basically what I was referring to is this question that um, why are women ignored when it comes to stories about mountain walking and it. Uh, Really, it's the same uh, for me. It's the same question as why women ignored as artists, um, um, because I think creativity is has been for so long the male domain, and tra but traping and trudging, meaning walking about that involves practical necessity, uh, could they could associate that with women, and walking to fill water containers or walking to wash clothes in a river and so on. These types of walking are for men. I'm 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 sorry. I'm being very very uh, uh, um, one-sided here uh, to, to make a point uh, <laughs> I, I don't I wouldn't put ev all men into a bracket of uh, like this but but over time over many hundreds of years so um, men have been terribly threatened by women who've moved beyond the domestic domain who've moved out of the kitchen literally so um, when they ve venture out of the world of domestic tarts is threatening for men um, and then Sonia, uh, overall, has said uh, the same goes for psychogeography too, alas, but we're doing what we can. And I was about to reply and say, yes, I agree, but mythogeography, Phil Smith's wonderful term, I think uh, I would suggest is, is a more uh, kinder and more inclusive term. And I would also like to replace, or I'd like to add to that, something called reciprocal geography, which um, means that we are beginning to learn to be responsible for our interaction with an impact on our environment. But I'm getting away from, from um, Kerry's point here. I'm sorry. I, um, and I, I think it's marvelous. Uh, the idea that men go up mountains and fall off them and are made heroes, and this is... <laughs> Uh, again, I want to just uh, do a slight dog's leg here in that um, there are an awful lot of heroes, uh, even today, that are spoken about and given Royal Geographical Society medals and taken films of. And yet, right now, this minute, there are boats full of people who've been running for their lives and they're given no Royal Geographical Society medal and they're not given any accolade and they're not written about. So the, the stories... The untold stories which Kerry is, is managing to, to, to dig up are, are terribly important for all of us, for all of humanity. And I won't ramble anymore. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> oh, thanks very much. Um, that was really, really kind, Mary Claire, uh, kind um, of you to say that. But lots of, lots of really interesting things there. i perhaps pick up on a couple and then see what other people um, make of that. Because um, I, I, th I think you're right that there is a relationship between um, practical matters uh, and that's somehow being a woman's 
domain, the, the, the walking for practical reasons. Uh, and I'm thinking of a, a, a road that's not very far from me, the, the Herring Road, which runs uh, from the coast to, um, to the next town to me, Lauder, uh, where women would, would take the creels of fish uh, from the coast for, for sale in the, in the inland market. And it's a, it's a wonderful path to walk. Uh, but women walked backwards and forwards along this, you know, hundreds of thousands of times um, for, with no record whatsoever what they thought or felt or, or why they did they enjoy it? Did they hate it? Um, and there, there are going to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of paths like that across Britain and indeed across the world where walking has happened for those sorts of everyday, unremarkable and yet so powerful and important uh, ways. And, and how we have, we as a society have somehow given certain types of walking of a particular social status. I don't quite understand how that's come to be. Um, but I'd really like it to be different because I think someone like Nan Shepherd, who writes really interestingly about interiors and lower spaces and the unusual places and finding with them within those enormous power and, and Dorothy Wordsworth too who walks to get the post who goes to collect firewood who goes to get mushrooms or eggs but who finds within those sorts of repetitive walking enormous personal and, and emotional power you know why haven't we been able to find a place for those stories in our you know the, the history of the walking that we've inherited I, I, I genuinely don't understand that mechanism I don't know if that's you know, a question that we can explore here, but it's something I'm really interested in, is, is how that cultural status gets applied to, and, and, and to what, how does that work? Uh, well, that might be something that, um, that might be something that Sonia overall might want to uh, chip in there, because Sonia, you, you were asking a question about um, okay, women's experience. Do you want to say what you're on there? Hello, um, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in um, whether you've come across, I know you, you've been predominantly looking at rural walking, but if you've come across any kind of correlation between the spaces of women walking and their experiences, I'm thinking particularly about encounters, having uh, in the last couple of years I've done some long distance walks across their pilgrimage routes and they, they move through urban and semi-urban and rural settings and my experience as a woman walking on her own on those routes um, it did fluctuate enormously with the spaces I was in so I just wondered if that was something you'd come across historical precedent for. In, in part yes uh, and I'm, I'm thinking of a writer like Anais Nin who was I mean she was so interesting to me because of the way in which she explores urban spaces um, and finds within those the power in the encounters that I think I have I haven't experienced the way that Nin did I've not, I've not felt that visceral fear but walking in urban spaces I've certainly been more on my guard and, and more aware of my surroundings more cautious of the sorts of spaces I might be about to venture into but Nin found these places enormously powerful you know the streets was where she felt at her at the height of her powers as a, as a, as a woman um, that there was absolutely a sexual element to that she enjoyed having the power over men she was a, a, a woman who enjoyed men's company very much um, and found it enormously powerful to be able to instigate or not a sexual encounter with with any man that, who looked at her or who indicated interest uh, and I'm not sure quite that's necessarily what many women would find on, on a, in an urban environment but it certainly challenged my perceptions about what women walking in the cities might feel. Um, so that's for me an, an interesting alternative. And, and I guess that those sorts of fears are also present in the rural, rural walking. And certainly talking to, to people I know who, who walk at the moment, that that's one of the most common reasons that women give for not walking on their own in the hills is they're, they're afraid of being attacked, even though the, the odds of it in the hills are so infinitesimally small that somehow that's been drummed into us as always something to be on the watch for. Um, but certainly from the urban walking I've read, and there's not, there's not as much of that kind of walking that I have been able to get hold of. Um, it is more the rural side of things, but the, the, the urban walking I have looked at paints quite a complicated picture about women's experiences and women's attitudes and, and that fluctuation that you talk about the confidence the ebbing and flowing of that confidence in that environment that's something that definitely comes across as well whether that's perceived or real um i think that's 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 a commonality that runs through it so that's that's a really interesting thing to think about and, and then applying that to my own sense of walking that even 
in a rural environment, my, my confidence also ebbs and flows for various reasons. And it perhaps be interesting to think about the dynamics of that and how that applies, you know, differently or similarly across rural and urban spaces. Thank you. That's really interesting. Uh, Sheila, you're waving at me. Are you about to ask something? Please do. I was just going to comment on two things on, on Kerry's and Melaine and what went before. Um, I often wonder is, like I do a lot of walking on my own, I have walked in probably five continents and if I want to walk, I walk. So I don't think about, you know, that's what I do, um, both urban and rural. And but but it's other people's perception of me walking is always what the problem is, and that is it. So consistently, people say, "Are you sure you're wise? You know, be careful. Are you wearing the right clothes? What's going to ha have you got your phone with you? What's going to happen if you fall?" Um, you know, I, I'll give you the list. Like there's a list, and in urban things, it's obviously now I'm I'm a good bit older, but when I was younger. You know, and I did a lot of, you know, and people would say, you know, my mother used to say, be very careful. You know, there's parts of the city that women with red hair are seen in one way, in one way only, you know, and so on. But so the stories, there's layers upon layers of things that were said to me. And it's what society says to women. And my view always was like, if I want to go somewhere, I'll go somewhere. And recently I've had a particular experience with that. Um, uh, because I broke my ankle very badly and I was on my own when it happened and it was an accident, it, was not, it wasn't walking. But, but, but everybody's saying, isn't it just as well, you know, you were near a phone, you were on your own, was that wise? And it kind of is, like, I just feel like saying, shut up. Like, you wouldn't say that to, you know, there is a romantic idea if the man rode into town, you know, stranger came into town, he was on a horse, he'd come a very long way, you know. And it, like it's the same you, that that person is always a man. It's not a woman. You know, a woman rode into town. She was on a horse. She came a very long way. You know, she got off the horse. She went into a bar and said, "Give me a beer." You know, so so that's the first thing that I'd say. It worries me that the perception of women and young women. I'm older now. I've got two daughters. You know, and one of them is travels all the time on her own. She's a journalist, and you know, I'm really careful to say to her, "Don't listen to what people say because they the fear comes from other places. It doesn't come from inside you." Maybe that's one thing in in certain cases. The second thing is the urban Melena mentioned urban and rural walking. And I wonder for me, walking is something that I do, but I do a lot in cities. And it, for me, it's it's not about the walking. It's about the uh, curiosity and exploration. And I think that sometimes is what women bring to it. Like, I love the people that I meet. I stop and have a chat. You know, I, I look in a door. So it's, it's a, walking for me is a way of living in real time and exploring places. And it's the same, like I spent today up in the Dublin mountains, you know, um, on my own walking. Like, is it, so, so it kind of comes from something other than walking. And so I think what has happened is a whole myth has been created about this, the kind of, there's a very male thing about, you know, about, um, you know, a, a big stories, the big adventure stories, like conquering, battling, you know, struggling, you know. Whereas maybe for a lot of women, it's about curiosity, it's about exploration, it's about learning, it's about discovering. It, you know, it's not about asserting. It's it's about being in the in the city or in the landscape, and just looking outward from your position on your feet. I don't know if that makes any sense, but anyway, that's my. No, oh, thanks so much. I, I, I'm nodding and nodding and nodding, and I can see from the chat that other people are, are coming in as well. And so that that made a lot of sense to quite a few folk, I think. So thanks so much for sharing that. Um, and some of the things that I was thinking as you were talking was um, thinking about how that myth that we get told, oh, you know, what what are you going to do if you have an accident, which I've, I've heard as well. Um, how those fears then get internalised, or at least we are told that they get internalised, and then men having told us those fears or, or women who've internalized those fears then use that to tell us well what well, well, women wouldn't have walked because well why would they have done they would have been too afraid so it's an amazing cycle of, of those myths sort of coming round and round and round to always somehow manage to exclude women's narratives so even if they do overcome the fear well that's just yeah they're just the oddities yeah one of the books I was reading just literally four pages and 280 on women walkers because it just well there were, there were two examples but that was it the rest of them were too afraid you know there's no point looking for them so that that myth just gets perpetuated in really damaging ways you know damaging to the individual woman walker but also damaging to women collectively looking both to walk and to construct what men have taken for granted you know this this tradition this inheritance this notion that they belong in the mountains they belong on the streets they belong walking I think it's really hard for women to create that sense and 
you know, whether my book manages to contribute to the creation of that sense, I don't know. Um, but my, when you were talking about walking in cities as an exploration, um, I was um, in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. I was over there for, for eight weeks nominally, um, working in a couple of libraries on a different project, but it sort of became about this project. So I, I've never, at that point, I had never driven on the right-hand side of the road, and I didn't think Los Angeles was the time to be trying that for the first time. So I had no car, so I was walking everywhere. And I, the first day I was there, I walked 10 miles up to Pasadena and around. And that was an amazing thing to do. It was really lovely. I got to learn the geography of, the, of that part of the city. But I was really conscious that there was no one else anywhere on any of the streets that I was walking. And these were big, fancy residential streets. There were no other walkers. And it just that was the first time I thought, Maybe they think I'm a burglar. Maybe they think I'm homeless um, because there was just no one else walking. Everybody else was driving. So that was really strange. And then at other times I went off into downtown L.A. and I, I walked in downtown. I walked in Hollywood. I walked all over the shop. And in some of those spaces, I really did feel quite a sense of threat. Um, some of the des destitution, some of the, the state, the, the, the city it was so grimy that that was a really interesting contrast to other parts of the city. But for me, it was it was partly practical. So I just didn't desperately didn't want to die in a car crash on the L.A. freeway. But also it felt to me like a really good opportunity to get to know the place and, and find a way around. So that was that was a really interesting experience for me. And it sounds like for you, those are the sorts of things that you get out of urban walking. Um, and I, I don't know if there are other, other people listening to um, in the room just now who have found urban walking to be particularly powerful or particularly useful but th that was that was perhaps the most sustained bit of it that I've done um so yeah it really thank you so much for sharing all of your experiences uh, uh, that my brain is now firing in about three million different directions so I'm going to stop and let other people talk but thank you so much that was really great uh, uh, uh Elspeth Billy would you would you like to say something else? yeah I was thinking about language because I was recommended to read. I'm not uh, born in the UK. I've been here a long time, but my cultural references are elsewhere. And I walked with somebody who told me I had, I must read Robert McFarlane. That it would, it would en enrapture me had I read The Old Ways. And I, I read the book, and it made me so angry because I felt so excluded from the experience. I didn't understand these places. They didn't speak to me in any way whatsoever. And I think a lot of it is about language that excludes you or includes you in writing. And I'm just reading a book by Bernardine Evaristo. Um, it's about girl, woman, other, and it's about being black and growing up in the UK and being part of the UK. And there is not a single punctu bit of punctuation in that book. I read it and I burst out laughing because I just thought this is so great. She's written a whole book without a full stop. And it's published. And it's her voice. And I think it's that thing of trusting your voice. And allowing it to be heard. And as somebody else mentioned, not adopting. Um, male white paradigms in terms of the writing of the experience. Because that that is what's it, that's what because you can experience it as a woman, but if you then write about it in a certain way, you are excluding people. Thanks so much for that, Elspeth. That, um, partly, well, particularly to Robert McFarlane. Um, I don't think I could have put quite why I felt cross in such clear uh, Kerry, we're not hearing you. We've got a slight problem with the audio. Um, I think we've lost Kerry altogether at the moment. So uh, just, uh, just bear with us. Let's see if we can get her back. <laughs> Um, uh, Emma, um, uh, with Kerry not in the room, um, you've you've made a couple of points um, about urban walking and things. Do you want to uh, say them out loud or say, add to what's the discussion? Um, but I'm just I was talking about urban walking in my experience of, li of of living in a very sort of um, 
a traditional mill town in Rossendale, which is known for its uh, mill traditions. And within 10 minutes, I can be up on the hill. Oh. Uh, keep going, Emma. Please yeah. Keep my dog's out there gardening at the moment. But I mean, for me, I mean, walking was a, just a, an infrequent thing, really, that m myself and my partner and friends used to do. So when we did, it was really a big expedition to go up Scarfell or Penny Gen or a big walk like that. And now it's part of my routine, you know, that um, it's dog walking, really, and that is a necessity for me. So um, in a way, it's, it's a responsibility that I have to fulfil because she is dependent on that for her, for her well-being. And but at the same time, these chance encounters I have to meet other people um, are great. But but equally, it's also nice not to encounter other people and be in my own headspace. You know, so equally, I'm very sociable. But I like because my work is so people focused. It's great to sort of escape that as well. So I don't actually mind if I don't see anybody. But if I do, then as my partner always says, you know, he always says, when I, I just, I'm popping out, taking the dog. He said, right, I'll see you in three hours then. <laughs> when the walk should only take an hour. <clears throat> but yeah, it's great. I mean, just, I think apart from the connections with people and learning personal stories and narratives about the town itself or about dogs and, you know, that's usually the conversation. But I think being in the landscape, I think, um, what somebody said this actually it embeds you in the place lucy i completely agree with that i think exploring it on foot i think we should take our shoes off more often really um to really feel like we're embedding our our feet in there and sort of really taking roots i often wear wellies walking wellies which are brilliant um and they're just sort of all weather wellies to be honest um i'm running out of things to say now my head's not working very well <laughs> i have to well. apologize uh, Emma, don't worry, you've done well. Uh, Kerry has reappeared in the room, so that's great. Yeah. Okay. I, I just thought, before Kerry said anything more, I'd just ask Jenny's staff if Jenny was there, because uh, also I think you've made some uh, quite interesting comments there. Jenny, do you want to say anything Thanks, about Oh uh, Yeah, hi. Sorry, my video is still not working, but I was just thinking exactly what um, Emma was saying about my comments, which is kind of. Um, I walk locally now because in lockdown I'm a single mum with three kids and a dog and, and I walk with other women friends and we use it as a really kind of communal supportive space but actually to really be out in nature and have that peace and time and scope to really reconnect with each other and, and have a non-domestic environment but I use my walks, I make them, I turn them into drawings. And so I've used long walks that I've done that are kind of like personal journeys or pilgrimages, but also the walks that I do that are very practical and domestic or walking from the studio or to the, you know, to the train station or, or like that. So they all kind of combine because it, I don't feel like it's, it's very hard um, often as a woman and, and with a lot of the, the responsibilities that we tend to have to be able to go off and have have the time to go and do these epic walks, um, or at least I personally find it very difficult with what I've got to do. But it is that needing to ground yourself and being out there and, and embedding it within your life. Kerry, so would you like to come back in? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had this eerie experience where I could hear and see you all, and then apparently I'd vanished. Um, but I think I did miss a little bit of the conversation, so I'll perhaps pick up on what I what I heard um, there, which is, um, and and also someone. Let me just go back up into the chat because this is sort of connected. Is I see it's Sonia, um, who again speaks for for me a little bit here and saying that. Um, Robert McFarlane made her furious because he just sort of disappears off, um, leaves the kids. You know, we don't know with whom he just goes. Um, that that there was a draft of my book where I was quite snippy about that. That I was advised to take it. <laughs> so I did get cross about that exact thing too. Um, and and hearing the other women talk, you know, uh, uh, Emma and, and and others talk about the importance of that space, that opportunity, wherever it is. It doesn't have to be. 
you know, at all on a mountain top, but any kind of walking um, free of domestic responsibilities, however short that time is, how precious that is. But it, it just frustrates me that that is so much more often something that has been negotiated for women. Um, and that the ways in which we've that this this cultural value that I was talking about earlier, this randomly ascribed cultural value has landed plump on the stories of people who don't have to negotiate these things at all as hard or as frequently, um, who are expected to be out there, who are supposedly stronger and more capable. You know, you know, when actually for a lot of people, what is the most meaningful kind of walking is the local, is the walks with friends, is the same walk that you did yesterday, which is the same walk that you did last year. And you just keep walking those same routes. And those are the sorts of walking practices that, that matter. And, and we just, how can we find, we need to find room for those in our stories of walking and, and what's important. Um, and I think this sort of comes back to the earlier point about canons and replicating the male canon and what can we do differently. Um, and and you know, whether that's stylistic, whether that's linguistic, whether it's emphasizing a broader range of walks as being important and, and, and considering those different kinds of importance. Um, but, but it's really, really lovely to hear about all these different sorts of walking that people are doing and, and how they've sort of been really important to people's sense of well-being. So that, that, that's me wittering a little bit, so I'm going to stop there and let other people come in because I can see that there's lots of conversations coming up in the chat. Uh, I, I was going to uh, Simon, you were questioning whether you had um... Uh, good reception or not, but Simone, if you've got a question to raise or something you want to say. Um, yeah, maybe I won't use my camera, but can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Ah, oh, great, okay. Um, yeah, I guess I was just thinking about Kerry's questions and what people have been talking around gender and mountaineering and just being in the Cairngorms Mountains at the moment and um, I guess talking about a canon and these canons or changing canons i think it's also like the canon is a is also you could change that word for systems or the systemic cultures around walking and gender i guess as a walking artist i've worked in both urban and mountaineering in sort of environments and i think my interest at the moment i'm working on a longer project called into the mountain which directly relates to Nan Shepherd's The Living Mountain text, but working with somatic and dance-based practices and working with lots of different different women living in the area and beyond, um, is that often that sense of community of coming together to walk has been quite prevalent in women's experiences who I've spoken to. But as I've got more involved in that sort of research over the past six years, it seems apparent to me <laughs> that, uh, you know, what in terms of making art and how we as artists also make work is like, how can we also contribute to those conversations that are actually questioning the systemic problems of, you know, a massive colonial history around mountaineering and and walking and the heroics of that to this idea of uh, more feminist approaches which is actually cultivating multi-voiced experiences of environments um, and that is kind of what I'm working towards I suppose that's where my interest lies it's like how do we get away from Robert McFarland being the only person to validate somebody else's writing you know he's also written the introduction to Jaquetta Hawkes' The Land also one of my ultimate favorite books I was gutted when they reissued that with another introduction from him not to have a big slanging match about Robert McFarlane but I guess my interest as well is that I think walking arts and particularly dance practices and all these other things that are outside of a literary canon can are also contributing quite significantly to these um, discussions about how we consider how women engage and you know and I still feel like I've been having the same conversation for so long now and that's not even and we're, not, we're only just getting into a question around like diversity of women in mountains you know but 
I think what I found shocking was after we'd done these performances in the Cairngorms almost two years ago now, was that that was the height of the diversity of bringing audiences to the Cairngorms Mountains as an example at the, at the meeting of Mountaineer in Scotland, because they were a partner involved in that. And you start to recognise, like, wow, if that's like the most diverse event, bringing people onto these mountains, then there's still a lot of work to do. But I think arts can also bring like these different lenses in, in which people can feel like they might be more welcomed into these spaces and and have more of a sense of community. But I mean, I could go on and on and on and write a PhD about this as well. So it's, but there's also something, I guess, around the leisure aspect of that and a very strong colonial history that's to do with men walking and putting flags on places. And so my feeling is that we have to question what mountain leadership even looks like and, you know, how we just start to shift the lenses and offer multiple ways of approaching these things. It means that some women might feel like they can enter into this kind of experience because they can see that there's new options in way in how to enter into that world of walking, not just through a very army based technical learning. Um, if you're doing mountain training, um, which can, I think, put a lot of women off and then, you know, being a mother and a new, you know, my child's nearly three now, but that's a whole other game in itself, which I'm learning is like a shocking sort of <laughs> barrier in a way. So I feel like there needs to be some really radical systemic sort of changes going on in order to even push the cannons. And I wonder, you know, and the Robert McFarland example of writing the introductions to these amazing women writers is also something to do with the nature of producing and selling books which is connected to a whole other industry that I don't totally understand but I know enough that you know you put a Robert McFarlane intro on it and the book is going to sell and so that kind of all that aspect monetary aspects of selling books feels like an important thing to push against as well I just want them to people who publish these books like Kerry's it's amazing and I hope you can feel like you can stick two fingers up to those you know, publishers who didn't trust you to write that book. Um, and yeah, just like, how do we, how do we begin? Like as a, as a collective of artists or people or activists and see it more like an activist kind of approach to trying to change these canons. And it just takes a really long time, but I am determined to continue feeling like I'm not getting sucked into the tropes of that and um, to push against it a bit more but I'll stop there I get very sort of <laughs> animated about this stuff I should probably take my son to bed <laughs> but thank you so much Kerry for talking oh, and cool. everyone really great Thanks so much, Simone. I'm, I'm, I, I, like a couple of other people who've spoken to that, my brain is just now firing in a hundred different directions. So thank you so much. It was really lovely to hear Otto in the background. So he sounds so happy. Um, so I, I hope he gets to bed soon. But before he goes, um, just to sort of come back, I, what I was particularly thinking about was your use of the word systems and thinking about what you said about Robert McFarlane's name being put on a book means that it's going to sell copies. And that was a debate that I had um, earlier this year when we were getting the book ready for press was my publisher wanted someone to do the foreword um, as a way of because you know, I'm not a known voice I don't have that cachet at all so a way of giving me a bit of a, a bump and the, the person that was most obvious in my mind was Robert McFarlane um, and I probably could have wangled it but it felt really important to me that it wasn't him and not just him but it wasn't a man at all I had a falling out with a friend about this who because he couldn't understand why I wouldn't go with the most famous person I could possibly get to sell my book. But it just felt like it really mattered that it wasn't a man introducing my book for the exact same reasons that Simone, you're saying you get cross um, that he keeps introducing your heroine. So when Kathleen Jamie said that she would do it, I was absolutely delighted because I thought that that was the most perfect fit. And her so intro actually reshaped what I thought the book was doing. 
Yeah, I think that was so great. When I saw the, the name of, on the forward, I was just like, yes, that's such a brilliant, a brilliant choice. Yeah, but but as you say, the systems there. Are, are, I mean, I, I I felt it to a certain extent that I when I sent this book off to agents a couple, or started to send it off to agents a couple of years ago, and some of them would come back and say, yeah, it's exactly the sort of book I, I enjoy reading, but I don't think I could sell it. Um, so I I, I I and I'm just remembering an article I was reading today about um, women in cycling or women's sports advertising and and this narrative that advertisers don't want to sponsor women's sports because no one watches them um when actually the data that people are gathering now is that the more sponsorship there is the more people watch and it's a really virtuous cycle and and whether that's a sort of systemic change we need to see if we can get in in publishing that that is one of the pinch points here that stops um women's voices getting out there women's stories getting told is that there's a publishing industry that has set itself up on various assumptions that you know people just don't want to read these stories so why bother printing them well actually you know as soon as you start talking and this, this event is demonstrating that perfectly that there's such a richness in women's experiences in, in in attitudes to walking different kinds of walking different views on it you know feminist practice there's all sorts of stuff coming out of this conversation um i can't imagine how that wouldn't be replicated you know many times over if you've got other groups of people together so I, I don't know if I have any answers to this question, but it seems I think you're absolutely right, Simone, that we need to tackle the systems and find ways of working differently, telling stories differently, you know, in, in the, some, of, some of the ways that have been suggested tonight. So thank you so much for what you've said this evening. That's really, really lovely. Um, OK, I'm aware of that uh, uh, Lucy and Lucy Paris and Amelia uh, have posted a couple of things in the chat and I haven't given them a chance to voice them, so I don't know whether Lucy or Amelia would like to, to say anything at this stage. It, was, it just just felt to me a little like I, I've just um, I've just done an MA where, um, having started as a printmaker, I ended up as a walking artist. But none of my walking was done sort of in mountain settings. It was done in Edgelands, and. It just felt like that sort of Edgeland walking was as much of an adventure for me and a challenge as it was, in fact, more so in many ways than it was sort of walking up a mountain. And I think that for many people, um, mountain walking isn't practical. Um, like there are people on here talking about having small children. My sort of routine walking started when I had small children and I lived in London and I walked miles with them. Um, and the challenges that are faced um, by young mothers with children in push chairs um, is, I think is an interesting angle on um, children walking um, and walking in, an, in a sort of non-urban or edgeland setting um, in that sort of liminal landscape where you have this sort of balance between the security of being near an urban setting and yet the adventure of being in something that is um, rather nondescript, it doesn't fit categories um, and and there are many people doing walking in those kind of areas mainly people like dog walkers um, people with young children on bicycles um, teenage kids hanging around and I, I just think that um, there's possibly there's, there's an area of walking there to be explored um, within sort of writing there's, there's only a couple of pieces of writing that I know of and that's the um, Edgeland's book, um, Paul Farley. Yeah, that's just just thanks. just something that I put in there. No, thanks, thanks so much, Lucy. That's really helpful, and and I, th I think. You know, Simone mentioned the challenges of walking as a as a young as a, a new mother. Um, I've also got a two year old, and I'm pregnant with my second child, and 
the physical consequences of walking whilst pregnant are, you know, I've not read anything about that. It's not part of the story. And I, I don't know where that fits for me. I've tried, I've, I've started to write about it. It's garbled gobbledygook at the moment, at the moment but as a way of doing something with that. But you know, my, my pelvic pain means I have to be really careful. I have to wear a support belt to keep everything held together because the relaxing is having a powerful effect. And I can't carry my son because he's, you know, two tomorrow and he's 15 kilos and, and, and that's, you know, really tiring. Um, but it's also presented opportunities for us. We've got we've got a lovely um, community woodland. I, I live rurally, but this is a, a community woodland near the village where I live. And um, my son adores running around that. And that's a bit more of an Edland sort of place. Um, I'm thinking about the practicalities of that. And, and I, I guess... It knocked me a bit when I read it in McFarlane, but it's it's made me more angry since. Uh, thinking about people like you know Samuel Taylor Coleridge in, in, in 1802, he nicks off to walk up Broad Stand, and he just leaves his wife and his children behind. There's no hesitation, there's no pause, um, and then he just wanders off to Malta and leaves them behind and abandons them. And, and that sort of the difference experience between fathers who walk and mothers who walk that, that that's, that's that's so powerful and and then when, when you're talking about edgelands and local environments and, and the immediate that's what you access when you've got those encumbrances and, and you you find a way to find significance but how do we get that into the, the the written record or the or the practice or the art about walking um when there seems to be very very set views of what is culturally important what matters what people are prepared to publish so um, I think that's a really helpful insight and, and thinking as well about edgelands as a this strange space in nature writing as well you know more broadly it's it occupies a, it's sort of started to become more fashionable to talk about those edgelands but I'm not sure in the sorts of ways that you've been talking about them which is to me are much more interesting so thank you so much for sharing that perspective that's that's really illuminating uh, uh, Amelia does Amelia want to say anything? Uh, because Amelia has been very helpful, Kerry. She's pointed out that your book is in stock and can be ordered and has provided the URL. But Amelia, there are quite a few things uh, earlier on in the chat that you were mentioning. Would you like to talk about anything at all? Or? Um, well, I, I think, hello, I think like Kerry, my brain is going in a hundred different directions and I've scribbled notes all over the place and it's fascinating to hear from people who are rural walkers who are artists talking about walking um, who are encouraging other women to get walking I feel like my walking has been quite solitary and it's usually to make sense of where I am physically in the world and also to make sense of where I belong in it like how do I feel when I walk the streets I've lived in London for half my life so my walking is mostly London walking and that's always been against the background of male psychogeographers uh, Ian Sinclair and more like like Will Self kind of took over that a bit and I've wanted for so long to find women talking about walking and being in cities and I haven't I know there are a couple of people out there like the Flanners book I've got in the author that I've missed I've missed being able to read about people like myself walking rather than conquering mountain heroes who don't need to worry about their safety or stuff like that and i'm really excited that kerry's book hopefully is going to swell the ranks of people who have already been writing about this and people who will come and will get the confidence for more conversations and write their stories and uncover old stories and bring it all together and i think this it feels like this could happen organically but it's um it's really wonderful to be part of the conversation so thanks kerry for your book and also for this talk today that was a bit of a ramble. <laughs> You're really welcome. Sorry, I dropped out and, and, and missed the middle bit, but I think I caught the, the, the crucial beginning and end. Um, okay. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, th I think the, the, the central thing for what you said there was seeing yourself represented and how important that is and how frustrating it is to perpetually not see yourself represented, to not see people like you doing the sorts of things that you enjoy um, and how that shapes our sense of whether this is something that's for us and, and I think that applies for lots of different groups you know, I, I was at a, an event last night talking about um, people of different ethnic origins trying to access the countryside and not seeing themselves represented in various ways and how damaging that is um, so 
and and then talking about Will Self, who's a, you know another big name who just you know has to tell his agent he wants to write a book and it's got a publisher and off he goes and it's all fine. Um, when there are other women who are doing different kinds of walking and, and Lauren Elkin's book that you mentioned, Flaneurs, is a really interesting exploration of those sorts of ideas. But that I don't know that there's been another one to follow Lauren's book. I know she's she's working on another book at the moment, but. We, are we going to be able to build up that critical mass of texts that finally persuades publishers? I, I, I don't know how we move past that chicken and egg situation where um, we, we don't seem to be able to get the books published. So, you know, people don't think there's there's a market for the books to be published. Um, but I would be really interested to hear what it's like to walk the cities, you know, the city streets as a woman. Um, I feel like I've read the same stories by men a hundred times. So where are the new stories coming from? How can we get those out there? So thanks so much for sharing your perspective. That was really interesting. Yeah, could I say something? Of course you may, Bob. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, I, I put a thing. It was my mum used to walk the uh, lanes of Sway, um, and um, partly to get away from her dad, but mainly it's a sort of spiritual. Thing. And she had lots of experiences, but because they were spiritual and she didn't want to share them because she might lose her contact with the spiritual if she told. But she told me one story and this Jaguar car pulled up in front of her and these two men started walking rather menacingly towards her. And when she got back to the bungalow, everything, all the surfaces in the kitchen were covered in soot. And she has no idea. And I think also um, walking under the trees was a, a, a very refreshing experience for her. So I just wanted to hear those two little stories. Uh, thank, thanks so much, Bob. That's, that's really helpful. I, th I think that idea of walking being spiritual and also walking as personal freedom, I think that ties in with what a few other people have said this evening about the space to walk being so important. Um, and be, being able to explore yourself on your own in your own headspace, I think that's that's really significant, and that ties in, I think, with what some people have been saying about motherhood as well. But th there is that sense of threat which we've discussed um, in other things. And I'm, I'm thinking of the moment in Cheryl Strayed's book Wild, where she's otherwise on this remote Pacific Crest trail, and yet has this terrifying encounter again with two men who come out of nowhere and start talking to her, and it's. And, and it's, I think one of the things that's so disturbing is the inevitability of it shifting from a conversation to something much more sinister. That it's always loaded with that potential, and how women navigate whether it's a real fear or there's a real danger in front of them, or just as we were talking about with Sheila earlier, the the, the ways in which we get told we should fear things. I, I I think that's a really difficult thing to explore and to and to and to and to get around because these sorts of things do happen and I know a friend who runs regularly who keeps getting catcalled and followed and all sorts of horrible things so how do we exist in a world where those are real things that happen without succumbing to an overinflated sense of fear which isn't always ill misplaced I, I, I don't quite know how we, we, we do that and, and these are questions that aren't um, I think faced by that many men so what does that do to our sense of ourselves in the landscape? What does that do to our sense of ourselves belonging in these spaces? So thanks very much for sharing those two stories, Bob. Those are really illuminating. I, I, I got something else to add, if I might. Is um, my dad wouldn't let her walk in the forest. Uh, that was the man, man talking again. And the irony is that um, when he died, uh, she lost her sense of balance and was confined to the bungalow most of the time. I came down to be her carer. But she certainly saw her walking as a liberation. And that confinement of, of her dad and then her physical condition uh, is, is interesting, I don't know. Absolutely. And, and again, thinking about how this, it's not just an end of life thing for women, um, that those sorts of physical confinements happen or have the potential to happen. I, I, I am experiencing one now. It's going to get worse until I give birth and then it, I will probably be able to walk a bit more, but I'm still going to have a, a very young infant and that's going to keep me much closer to my house 
and the, the sorts of walking I can do out the back door than I necessarily want to. Because I, I do love the mountains. That is somewhere I really enjoy walking. And, and I'm sure for other women, as, as children have arrived or as domestic responsibilities have arrived, that there's that sense of closing in, of, of, of there being some sort of limitation, however, however it manifests, however that's felt, that those are moments that occur at various points in women's life. It doesn't, it doesn't just come at the end as physical decline takes place. So that's another really interesting perspective is to think of that relationship with, with, with senses of freedom and how important that is to a woman's lived experience. So again, thanks for really for sharing that, Bob. That's really helpful. Um, one of the areas that, uh, you know, we do with Walk, Listen, Create is, you know, we want to try to create more and more opportunities of people to work together and explore opportunities. And that's kind of tough because we're three blokes. So if at any time anyone who's in this um, uh, conversation thinks that they'd like to help us out and join in and curate conversations and invite other uh, artists of their choice uh, or writers to come and talk and be in a in a cafe, then we'd really welcome that. So um, that, that's a plug for, uh, for Walk, Listen, Create. Um, but I used to work as an urban designer, and I can assure you that one of the areas that uh, I'm really um, vehement about and very angry about is the way that uh, women and children are treated in the city uh, by the architects and the transport planners and highway engineers that, who create the actual urban environments in which we can walk uh, because they take very little notice uh, of uh, women and children uh, uh, throughout their age, whether they're young women, uh, whether they're teenagers, uh, often teenagers like to walk three abreast, and that's uh, because they're, um, uh, you know, they're having a three-way conversation with their friends. And you need wider footways for that, but we don't offer them that opportunity. And then, you know, women with young children and women who are incapacitated through pregnancy or heavy shopping or whatever you want to kind of think about it, we don't design our cities for that. So I'm really aware of that. And then when, as I'm growing older, I'm aware also of, you know, the fear of tripping, of falling, of fast traffic, not understanding or appreciating how fast vehicles are coming towards me, all those kind of issues. And I know that they're not just a, a masculine gender thing. And what we have created in our society are places where we have to live, which only service or serve men aged 25 to 50, if that, 25 to 40. And I think that, you know, what we need to do is we need to get that kind of revolution coming up where we actually say we have to design for everybody. But anyway, there's my little rant, okay? So, but uh, anyone else, that's given you a bit of time now. Five or six of you remain silent throughout. You haven't written anything in the chat. If you want to ask a question or pitch something into Kerry, Now's the time to do it. Harry, would you, I'll let you say anything more that you want to say as well, please. If you well, just, just, just in response to what you were saying about um, cities um, being designed about around men and just picking up on um, a couple of other points that were made earlier in the chat, um, that Caroline Criada Perez in uh, Invisible Women points out that Google Maps, when you ask it to find a route between point A and point B in a city will tell you the fastest place. But that's not that, that's that's what um, an unencumbered man might want. What a woman might more likely want is the safest route or the best lit route or the best route for a buggy or you know, and there's no way of getting Google Maps to do that. You can't get that on your phone. All you've got is the best is the, is the most direct route. And you've got no ability to, to, to tell what kind of environment that's going to take you through. So even at the level of the most fundamental mapping technology, women don't get the opportunity to evaluate the, the, the spaces that they're being asked to walk through. Um, and, and thinking about Virginia Woolf, thinking about Anais, and thinking about uh, Lauren Elkin, when they're writing about cities, they're writing about places they've come to know well, and that they're walking the same sorts of routes. They're not often venturing off into different places. So there, I think there's a sense of safety and familiarity about that. But what about the woman who's, um, you know, like, like Sheila was talking about, just curious? Um, how does she find out what kind of place she might be letting herself in for? 
you know, even at that very basic level, we're, we're excluding the sorts of women's walking or, or the sorts of walking that women may be more likely to do. And, you know, pointing back to what Simone was saying about systems, they're, they're, they're really deeply rooted in, in the way our society is constructed. So that's my hoping is worth about that. So sorry, a, a rant to follow your rant. <laughs> If I may hook into this, um, uh, Kerry, uh, you bring up um, the uh, inaccessibility of particular types of information uh, via, from uh, Google Maps. Uh, and I very much take your point uh, that you cannot see on Google Maps uh, whether a particular route is safe or not. Uh, but that is really because that data is not being collected, right? Uh, there is no information available uh, sub subject objectively as to whether a particular street is safe or not. Um, but there are some um, uh, initiatives that exac do exactly that. They do try to um, map the uh, safety uh, of uh, streets within particular cities exactly to uh, be able to create routes that avoid the dangerous parts uh, of the city. Uh, so it, it, this is being pursued, but not on the level that Google Maps would be able to do. Um, and uh, while I have the microphone, I would like to ask a question to Mary Claire. Uh, sorry, Carrie. <laughs> um, Mary Claire, you mentioned uh, in uh, your very first chat that uh, you're, you, you practice drift singing methodology. And I think I have to know what this is. <laughs> it's something that I invented for my uh, practice-based PhD. Can you hear me? Okay, so I, uh, I started off by drawing and I was asking the question is, when you are a practitioner and you're working in the outside environment, can you evidence an interaction between the practitioner and that environment through drawing? And I noticed that when you draw from observation, it's simply you're taking information, you're not interacting with place. When you draw onto the environment, such as a games pitch marker or that kind of thing, you're actually imposing a sign onto the environment, which um, Andrew Stuck would be very well aware of, all the signs in our environment that direct us through place, that make us infantile in a way, so we have no choice. And interestingly enough, when I drew um, floor plans, life-size floor plans of buildings and ships on parks, in London, I noticed that passers-by would follow the line like you would follow a sheep trail. So they're, you know, unconsciously using them as a, a marker that marks safe passage because it's well trodden. But that's not an interaction, it's an imposition. So I realized that the only way that you can draw through space is if you understand that sound can be a drawing because it's, uh, it, it moves through place, it's durational and it's spatial. So if you, if you understand that sound can be a drawing or a drawing can be made in sound and you make that sound with your own body, you are the tool that generates that sound, then you do interact with place through refraction and reflection and echo. Are you with? Uh, okay. <laughs> so I, yeah, I so invented it's... this. I, <laughs> I invented this terminology called drift singing, which obviously borrows from the, the, from the situationist drift and so on. Um, and I, I did a multi-voice drift, drift song through a place called Bunhill Fields, which is in London, where Daniel Defoe and William Blake are both buried. So I was kind of curtsying to the, to the men of psychogeography or to the godfathers of psychogeography. But I am very well aware that there's been a lot of, there are an awful, in fact, there's a, a book called Psychogeography in which not one woman is mentioned. <laughs> so oh, I'm, I'm sure I'm, there are actually many. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thrilled that well, Kerry has written this book. Thank you, Kerry. And thank you so much for asking me what, okay. Now, I, my next question is, uh, can you share some links with this? Uh, Yes, I can. I can try and find my YouTube uh, things. Uh, they're very old. I have to say, I haven't been doing this for a long time because performance is something where you are in the in the gaze of the other, and very much like what Carrie was talking about, what everybody has been talking about. When when you're a woman outside, 
you attract attention in a, di in a different kind of way than if you were a man walking through place. But I have to say that, oh, that, also, uh, uh, that also applies to people from different cultures and of different ethnicities. There's a wonderful artist called um, William Pope L. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's an African-American artist, and he, he has done all kinds of performances in New York, crawling through space on his hands and knees. And whereas if he was a white Af American, it would just be the artist who crawls through space, but it's not. It, it is at William Pope Bell. So he stands for all of African Americans. So perhaps in a way, and in some small way, if a woman walks through space or crawls through space, she stands for all women as well. Perhaps there is a link there in, in some way. Uh, but no, I'm out of my depth. It's not my field, and I shouldn't be... Um, but yeah. No, but I think your point is very valid. Uh, when you are the outsider, you are always, uh, in a certain way, uh, mistrusted by the people who are not the outsider or the insider. Um, I'm, uh, I'm originally from Iran, so uh, whenever I cross a border, I get randomly picked for uh, extra questions, right? So I'm also ah. always uh, the outsider. Um, and uh, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, still a white, middle-aged, uh, able-bodied man, so I've got that going for me. Um, but uh, I do think that uh, a lot of the problems that you describe and that Carrie uh, uh, touches on uh, are because uh, women uh, are, are uh, well, created the consequence of women being outsiders, considered outsiders in the field of psychogeography, so they are different, and therefore uh, they are, yeah, the other. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mary Claire, I, I'm really glad Babak asked that question because I also saw that in the chat and didn't know what that meant and really wanted to know. So that's that's really <laughs> awesome and that's given me some interesting thoughts about different ways of interacting with place. I, I think I followed the technicalities of it um, and that's really, again, thought provoking. I could feel my brain sort of going, again, firing in far too many directions at once. Um, but what you said, the psychogeography was a book I read in whilst I was researching um, my book, and it just it wasn't the first book where there was not a single mention of women. But I do remember just thinking, "Oh my God, here we go again." They're just where where are we? Where are we? And I'm picking up on Bab what Babak just said. This idea that anyone who isn't that what was it, white male, 25 to whatever. Um, how, how how is all of that you know the majority of human experience somehow being categorized as other how have we ended up with that as the, the default male that caroline crowder perez talks about um how has all of that ended up as other when, when we're the bulk we are we are the majority of, of those human stories um I, 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 and how do we go about redressing the balance and, and thinking about the other sorts of suggestions for feminist practice that maybe it's these sorts of imaginative ways mary claire that you were talking about of getting into the relationships between people and space in new and innovative ways. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, and Babak, again, huge gratitude for asking the question that I, I meant to ask and then forgot. That's, that's really great. Uh, Jenny Staff, Jenny, you mentioned something in the chat, very pertinent. Um, do you want to raise that? Yeah, I've, I was just, um, I've been looking to see if I can find any kind of um, queer or LGBT walks or art walks. And I think there's, there's something that I found in the States, I think, one kind of artist collective, but there doesn't seem to be any, because we were talking about other and, you know, um, you know, just not this kind of white, cis, straight male um, kind of com concrete and just thinking about all the other groups as well who aren't represented in walking communities and it was just something that I wondered if anybody had um, knew anything about because all I could think of really was pride where because we were talking about safety and how safe it is to walk as an other out in out in the environment and how vulnerable people can feel and so that's you know Obviously, Pride is a collectively safe event that's come from, you know, from not being safe at all. So um, I'm just sticking it out there. Yeah, 
Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Jenny. I, I don't have very much information about this. This is one of the many gaps in my book that um, I hope if I do more, more writing about walking, I'll be able to address, but perhaps other people know um, who are in this, in this room who might be able to add something to the, to the sum of our knowledge, because I would be really keen to know more about that. Um, OK, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, say it's the sort of last shout. OK, so um, this is your chance if you haven't. Um, uh, Sheila's coming back, but that's good. Don't worry. Don't, not yet, Sheila. So if, uh, if there's anyone who hasn't spoken or hasn't written in the chat and they want to say something, or if there's anyone who wants to say something, now's the time to say it because we're going to kind of wrap up. We're going to give Kerry the last word. Um, we're... Um, we're going to encourage you to continue the conversation in the comments section of the uh, event. If you go back to the event website, you'll find the comments section first, and then anyone else but Sheila first. I just wanted to say that I, I, I hear a, a little bit of despair or something, and I would say courage. I think that the work that Kerry has done is amazing. I think that there are other people who've gone before. I mentioned Dervla Murphy in, in the links, but there's various different women that over the years have done it. But I really think listening, I've also, I don't know if there are people here involved because I'm, I'm in Ireland, but they're, they're, the singing in, the, in the, the Scottish mountains, there's various groups that I see of women, wild women out there, women walking, women alone. It's on Twitter where I see them, you know? And I think that, that you know, that, that phrase uh, Gina Davis said, if you can't see it, if you can see it, you can be it. I mean, I, I think that what you've done, Kerry, is terrific. And I, I worked in media, a television and radio producer for nearly 40 years, and I'm really aware of the problems. I'm really aware of equality and as it is represented. So I just think, you know, I, I'm, I have fought a battle for 30 or 40 years for equality. And I just think you just got to keep doing it. And I think there's a lot more going on it will come together and it will happen and it may not happen it may happen for our children it may not happen for us but i just say have courage all of you you know every little bit that somebody does is moving the discussion on and also don't listen to anybody when if you want to go up a mountain on your own go up a mountain on your own if you want to walk into the dodgy parts of the city do it don't you know just do do it just as a person gender free whatever anyway that's all i'd say it's really interesting and thank you Oh, thanks, thanks, Sheila, for your call to arms. Is there? And I, I think you're right. Um, when I started this book, I, 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 it was born out of anger and frustration. Um, but as the books reached completion, there's been a, I've, I've felt a real change in, in, in the weather. That it feels like there's this growing body of, of, of work. That there's a, a momentum there. Um, thinking about all the amazing podcasts that are about women's adventuring and the walking groups and the things that are getting put onto the TV and things that are in on the radio, um, it feels like there's a real body of, of, of work coming together. I think it is going to mean something significant. And you know, it, it, it's a real privilege to have contributed just a small thing to that. Um, and the, this, this conversation is another contribution towards that. And, and it all feels really exciting. And I hope that we'll be able to see something sort of tangible coming out of that, hopefully whilst we can benefit from it. So th thank you very much for your call to arms. I, I, I feel that quite deeply. So thank you so much. Um, OK, Sonia, do you want to mention uh, something about uh, the Women Who Walk Network? Oh, yes. Um, sorry, I, was, I wasn't attempting to plug. I just wanted to say yes, yes to Sheila there about that call to arms. And I, I had a moment of extreme fury. A few years ago, after reading Will Self's Psychogeography, and at the beginning he talks about the psychogeographical fraternity, and I just sort of read, really, and I, I met several women who were identifying what they did as psychogeography. I, I understand the, the desire to call it by another name, but I, I don't see why I should have to. What I do is psychogeography, so tough. I'm a female psychogeographer, you know, get over it. Um, I set up the Walking Artist, the Walking Women Who Walk Network, um, shortly after joining the Walking Artist Network because there was a desire to to bring more women together from different fields. So there are academics, um, field walking archaeologists, um, writers, artists, people who are just obsessed with walking, um, and it's just a place for people to um, 
share their their experiences and their projects so if you're interested just just google women who walk network or look me up on twitter um i desperately need to update the website because i've been incredibly busy um walking i'm glad to say so and writing so it's it's difficult to keep on top of it but do please um join if you're interested Thanks so much for that. I, I love the idea of, of will self fury. Um, that that's I, I I feel like I've I've found people who feel the same way about these books as I do. It's such a relief. Um, and I love that you're still walking and you're still furious. I think that's amazing. So a look at your network. Thanks so much for sharing that. Okay, final last orders. Anyone else want to say anything more until we hand over to Kerry? A deafening silence, Kerry. I'm going to hand over to you. You have the last word. Um, more importantly, Kerry, we want to say thank um, you. So uh, I'm going to say thank you very much, Kerry, for all you've uh, provoked. Uh, it's been brilliant. So well done provoking and have the last word. Um, well, I, I was going to say thank you to everybody who's contributed so magnificently this evening. It's It's been a true pleasure to listen to so many different perspectives, to have my brain pummeled and provoked and excited in so many different ways and to have my perspectives challenged and developed. So thank you so much to everybody uh, for all that you've done tonight. It's been an absolute, it's been a privilege.